Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, both online and here in person. So yes, thanks John. So I'm going to tell about how does the challenge of improved understanding of atmospheric wind power plant flow physics fit into the lighthouse projects. Um, in summary, I can say it, it fits very well. And what I'm going to do is sort of explain how these challenges um, can be understood in the context of the lighthouse projects. My name is Jake Badger. I'm at DTU Wind Energy, and I'm also the um, sub-program coordinator for the um, SP3 um, in the uh, ERA JP Wind um, Management Board. So I just work out this button, advances it. As John said, um, the Vies et al. paper from 2019 in, in science listed these, um, it was a very nice um, sort of consolidation of, of the different challenges and, and put into these three. And I will address the first one, improved understanding of atmospheric and wind plant um, flow physics. And there was a very nice graphic um, in the summary, re the review summary, which shows this um, globe and then this um, sort of meso scale. So this is flow at relatively kind of regional, so looking at two, one kilometer to about 50 kilometers. And then to the interplant flow, this is what's happening at the, the plant scale um, interaction between turbines and so on. And then actually at the, the turbine level. One of the plots um, I show a lot is actually in that connection um, with the research that um, many of my colleagues are doing, um, both at DTU and elsewhere with modeling, but, but it's also very va valid for what we need to do in terms of measurement too. But it's moving, um, looking at meteorological flow at different scales, moving from the global scale where we can get actually a lot of uh, very good data um, for multiple decades, and this is very useful for long-term um, assessment, but it's too coarse. So we go to the MESA scale, so that was also mentioned in the, the science paper, where we see a lot of interesting details emerging especially in time and space. Uh, this is a picture of the Gulf of Mexico and Mexico, part of a, a Wind Atlas for Mexico project. But I'm showing it because it shows a lot of structure, um, detail, and, and complexity. And there is interest just looking in the offshore areas, in the Gulf of Mexico, but also in the Pacific there. Lots of variation. Um, waves established at meso scale. Um, also the effect of the orography on the, on the offshore flow is, is interesting. Um, for example, there's a gap flow which has extends, uh, affects resources, um, tens or even hundreds of kilometers off, offshore as well. Um, and we also have to add extra sort of drama to this picture is there's a, a hurricane, so there's an extreme event. But of course I need to put this into the, into the European context. Um, but if I had a European animation there, I think we'd see uh, equally interesting structure and complexity. Um, there's also then we move to the micro scale where we have interest. Um, I'm not sure if I can play that animation. Well, maybe one of the um, technical team can help. But there's a large eddy simulation there at the top showing the, a turbine. If you click on the, um, the top right picture, it should play an animation where we can actually start to um, see turbulence at scales in time and space relevant for, for a turbine. Um, and then we also have quicker models in order to, to do resource assessment and site conditions um, at turbine sites. Thank you. Thanks very much. But this is just to illustrate all of that complexity um, that we need to be able to understand, model, measure, um, and also sort of disseminate and make useful and relevant um, to the wind energy community. Um, so looking at the first uh, initiative, um, the floating wind energy, it's the short title. I always like to show this picture, which comes from the Global Wind Atlas, where you can actually select anywhere in the world um, different water depths. There's now a bathymetry layer. And on the uh, left-hand side, anything that isn't um, the very dark blue is water over 50 meters. And everything that is like uh, lighter blue and white is 50 meters. And then on the right-hand side, you see the same kind of plot, but now the, 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 the legend is changed to show um, water less than 500 meters. And I think this just illustrates what we've heard this morning about all of that extra, all of those new seas that are opening up 
um, to the floating winds. So we've got, we heard about the five uh, basins, so we've uh, North Sea, Baltic, Mediterranean, Atlantic, and Black Sea. So you can see just by opening up that new depth, um, there's these resources, um, sort of our, our playground becomes much, much bigger. Um, but how to understand all of that? So we've had, um, we've, we have a research agenda um, in era JP Wind, and we, we went about trying to put that into the context of the Lighthouse initiatives. And part of that was also in some workshops that were held on the 5th and 6th of May this year, virtually, I think it was purely virtual. Uh, and we had 50 or so uh, participants, and we actually went through these um, research agenda points. Thanks very much to, to, to Jan Willem Wagner and also Peter Essen for also this consolidation. Um, but we had a big discussion and a big Miro board where we looked at these. So they're looking at wind conditions in European seas and oceans to large heights. Uh, measurements in situ and remote sensing, um, inflow to wind turbine and uh, floating structures. So the modeling that's needed at that, this is a multi-scale again, so how do we go from something telling us about the ambient flow to something where we need to know the flow in, in great detail. Um, and then understanding variation over the different seas. So as I mentioned, those seas opening up, so we're no longer sort of looking um, with great focus at the North Sea. We have all of these seas also to look into. Then understanding the met meteorological and ocean physics and being able to model that and also validate um, what we model. So wind conditions, again, analyzing data sets, improving the models, also great interest in the turbulence conditions, being able to analyze new data sets and um, improving the models for turbulence conditions. And also site-specific models for wind characteristics. So again, we're looking at things that can be useful um, without needing to run very um, uh, computer, um, uh, high uh, computational resources required. And then wind wave interactions, um, important um, too. Um, what came out of that uh, workshop were some additional things that were given extra weight um, that were not, maybe not listed so uh, much in bold as, as could be. So these, this, is, this is sort of some outcomes um, looking at the workshop uh, Miro boards. So a new, new measurement technology to give uh, long-term data sets in new waters um, the, the floating, wa uh, floating wind opens up. Um, new t measurement technology to reduce uncertainty in measurements. Um, and new types of uh, floating platforms um, to be able to work in these, uh, these new seas that are becoming available to us. Um, and then assessing the impact of wind currents and waves conditions in new waters, thinking of how that um, will affect installations and, and also the operation and maintenance of these floating wind farms. And then in greater integration of atmospheric um, and ocean conditions into design phases, um, both with modeling and measurement. And I've got some pictures there to, to give some inspiration about some of these different platforms that are emerging um, from a, a paper from um, Julia Gotcha from 2017, but just showing you the range of, of technologies and how those are moving forward. And then also that Remote sensing will be an important part of this um, gathering of, of data over these basins with such large um, um, extent, physical extent. So from uh, EU METSAT uh, web pages there, showing precipitation in that case. If we move now to integration of large scale offshore wind energy, um, we have the research agenda here. So again, it's linking from meso scale to micro scale. Um, as I said before, we need to be able to go from the, the sort of basin scale of those seas down to the uh, wind farm and then to the, to the actual turbine level. We need to understand the wakes that are um, present and developed inside wind farms themselves and how that affects the wind farm production. But we also need to go beyond that and look about at how uh, a wind farm affects the ambient um, and its surroundings. And we hear about you know, large-scale blockage effects, for example, and speed up around uh, wind farm edges, and all of these things need to be better understood, whether it's an energy redistribution or, or just a, um, a sort of pure blockage. So these things are very much in, in discussion in the research community. Um, then expanding beyond wind conditions. So a lot of the focus has been on wind speeds, but actually our modeling um, and measurement can do much more than that. Uh, we're hearing about importance of precipitation, for example, with... Um, uh, blade erosion, so we can find out about precipitation uh, much more, but it could also be temperature, cloudiness, 
and other types of uh, uh, parameter. Um, and then impact on climate, so we're actually moving even sort of backwards from the smaller scale back into the larger scales again. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so workshop additions here, the impact of large scale um, on, on many environmental factors. As I mentioned, there was more, there was a lot of people saying in those workshops, uh, what about uh, temperature precipitation? What is, if we have a massive uh, uh, enlargement of offshore uh, wind in these basins, um, especially, particularly perhaps the North Sea, where we have all of these plans for energy islands and energy, energy hubs and so on, um, what will be the environmental impacts of those potentially secondary impacts on the ecological system, for example. Um, greater focus on time series and temporal characteristics, variability, seasonality, and variable predictability. So we need to be able to integrate this power into an energy system. How does the, you know, how, how will that work? Uh, there are a lot of challenges there, and they, the flow and understanding the meteorology and oceanography will help us. Um, and then greater connection to the atmosphere and ocean conditions for the planning and design and operations phases. And the inspirational pictures here is uh, a project called UKKO, which is um, looking at seasonal predictability of winds. Um, there's a web page there you can go in and see different ways that can be presented, which would be important when you have to actually uh, do energy planning. Um, and then the second picture there is we're looking at energy hubs and how they'd be distributed in the North Sea, enabled enabling transport of energy between those countries in the, around the basin, but also picking up um, energy on, on the way in, um, could be energy islands or energy hubs. And we need to be able to dimension those correctly, taking into account um, these flow effects that those very large wind farm clusters will have um, on their own resources. Um, so just to finish up, uh, just say um, that all of these topics will be coming up in our, in our session um, on, on um, Wednesday at 2 o'clock, where we have an SP3 session on wind conditions and climate, climatic effects. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I think we can have uh, one or two questions also for Jake before we go to the next speaker. Oh, who, who's you deciding? Yeah. Yeah. Antonio? Hello. Yes, please. Oh, wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. Can you, is yep. it working? Okay, Jake. Uh, uh, okay, a little um, thinking about what you just uh, presented. I saw that uh, you are focusing also on the systems for measuring the wind mm -hmm. in offshore. Mm. So uh, I guess that the models that we have right now from meso to micro scale, uh, they, they might be depending quite a lot for calibration on the measured data the real data that we obtain. So if we are changing, and this is my question, if, if we are changing or we want to improve the measuring systems, that means that until we don't have this kind of new measurements, we will not have very good calibrated models? Yeah, I may, I may spin it around another way and say, instead, thinking of calibration, I would say instead it's more of validation. So until we have the, the, the in situ measurements, can we be sure about what quantities and parameters are coming out of the, out of the modeling? So I say it's a very, important, um, a very important component in all of this. And I think that was also something that came out of the workshop. There were a lot of post-it notes going, uh, talking about this importance of uh, the measurement platforms because we are moving much further afield than before. I remember you know, a few years ago when people started using LIDAR that were long-range LIDAR placed on the coastlines to look out. And that was, you know, that was kind of near shore still. Now we're looking at something you know, quite, quite different, um, much, further, much further afield and, and very challenging to get those measurements. Um, so it could be, could be like, uh, as you say, a calibration um, or, valida or, valida or, or, a valid yeah. or a validation. But I think it's, it's, it is essential, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Also online, are welcome. No. Okay, can I have one question then? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in terms of uh, power sy system integration or wind, I would think, of course, a lot of research on wind conditions are important, but 
the sort of traditionally it's always been about um, prediction. Mm -hmm. um, what will the wind be or wind production be within the next minute or mm -hmm. hour or mm -hmm. day or, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be able to plan the operation of the mm -hmm. power system as best as possible. And this is research that's been going on for as long as I've been doing research on wind, which is quite a long time after all. Um, so I wonder, is this sort of at the level now where you can say it's as good as it can be, or are there still uh, things to be improved? Then, you know, can we reach to a level where you can say with absolute confidence in the next uh, three hours the wind production will be? Mm. <laughs> but I'd say that it's... Uh I would say it's um, a multidisciplinary um, challenge. And we also, we lean up against the uh, weather centers very much in providing us with some of that data. Hmm. And there you, have, you can see in the last decades there has been an improvement in the quality of the forecasts. Hmm. Um, so that's, you, I can't remember exactly the statistic, but it's something like um, uh, 20 years ago, the, the, ten, the ten day forecast, or the five day forecast is now as good as our 10, day forecast. So it's actually saying that we are getting mm. better. But there will be a time when it's very difficult to make an actual forecast mm. in that. Mm. Then you move to the seasonal forecasting and also an assessment of how predictable, how predictable um, the forecast can be. Mm. Because you can actually have different times of the season where it's actually easier or harder to make that forecast. Mm. But I would say another important part of, of the science community around wind energy is by actually being able to take the, the data that's coming out of the, the weather services and actually being able to put that and maybe make adjustments or corrections based on the actual uh, situation. So for example, we're seeing um, weather services now incorporating uh, wind farm parameterizations. So that's really interesting that up until now that hasn't been done, but mm. actually weather services are actually experimenting with putting in um, wind farm parameterizations to get that effect into the, into the meteorological fields. I think this is really, yeah. really fascinating. Um, but it could be other things where you, they're, they're not included yet, so you have to be able to mm. incorporate that maybe with a fast model to, to find out the effects of a, a wind farm cluster on a, on a particular parameter. What about uh, more short-term forecasting, like a few hours ahead? Is that... Uh... Yeah. So the, the, Typically, as you move to shorter timescales, you will use uh, more sort of statistical-based modeling rather than a dynamical mm -hmm. modeling. And that could be based on better measurements around the, the site or the wind farm of interest, or could be measurements of meteorological properties, but it could also be um, measurements of the, uh, from the power or, or from other types of measurements mm -hmm. um, from the turbines. Very good. I have no further questions for the <laughs> moment. <laughs> then, was there more? Ah. I, I have a curiosity. You mentioned it, the intra wind farm wakes uh, and the study of uh, this uh, subject. So, intra wind farm wakes, it was mentioned. But uh, is uh, this uh, the, the concern is uh, to make, to set up a control of the wind farms uh, one? Uh, with respect to, to the other, or just for understanding the record, the uh, mixing of the boundary layer mm. after the wind farm. So, I, uh, a curiosity about this concept of uh, intra wind farm. Yeah, okay, so there's which, the, which is the purpose yes. of that? So, with the intra, it's it's the turbines within the wind farm and their wakes effect, and then the inter is those yes between wind farms. So, the the interest there, well, it's, it's many many fold. But for example, as you say, how how does the wake decay? following a large wind farm. But it's also how does the next wind farm along suffer, you could say, from the presence of an upwind uh, wind farm. And this is something which is a, uh, yeah, a growing research area of great interest also for the industry, of course. They want to know what will happen to their production as wind farms are built um, in their surroundings. So it's, it's, of course, a very interesting scientific question about the entrainment and the decay of, of, uh, of wake, but also with a very um, concrete and um, applicable yeah, result, which is about the actual production and uh, could also affect the, um, the, the wind conditions affecting okay. the And I can stock. understand that uh, here in the, this uh, condition, the measurement uh, play, could play a great role. So the, 
how to measure the wind in between the wind farms is exactly. not, it's so, is not uh, yeah. So actually forward. the talk on, on Wednesday will feature a campaigns where there are measurements that are made using different types of uh, measurement technology. It could be airborne um, unmanned vehicles or it could be light, scanning LIDAR technology to get the understanding of the flow around the, the wind farms. Um, I think that really, for me, the very fascinating thing about it is that it is, we're, we're, in a, we're in a place now where we're doing modeling for these scenarios where they're, you know, we're talking about 450 gigawatts of wind in European waters. How would that actually be distributed? How, how would you actually build that out? And it's scenarios that we don't, it's kind of hard to do validation now because we don't have that huge capacity built yet. So we, we have to be able to do modeling. We have, to be able, we have to use the tools we have available to us to do our best kind of best offer of those effects. Um, but it's kind of also, people are right to say, have you validated that model? You say, yes, we've validated it to the best that we can, given the, the wind farms that exist today. But there is a kind of leap, so we have to be really careful and, and to understand that. Because the implications are quite um, big, in, I, I think, because if that last plot I showed, showing these energy hubs, so um, there's research going on to decide, to sort of dimension those. How many hubs should there be? How should they connect to the neighboring countries? Um, I think we need to be very careful to, to, to sort of think about the dimensions of those wind farm clusters and how they, how should those things, how should they be distributed? So if you look at wind farms um, off the German coast, for example, they're built with quite high capacity initially. These ones are like uh, 10, 10 megawatts per square kilometer. Um, and then I think gradually you're seeing a, a sort of more thinning out but uh, I don't think there's a kind of, um, I'd say we, we haven't kind of got the, the, the guidelines written on what kind of uh, capacity density should be used for these very large um, build-outs yet. So I think that would be something very interesting for us to work on. Okay, questions are pouring in also on uh, SMS okay. from Germany, Stefan Bartsch. <laughs> So he has a question to Jake. He says, how will the new radar scanners improve the offshore forecasting quality? Comma, or should that be part of the lighthouse? Mm, okay, that's a very good question. So this is about data assimilation into forecasts. Um, yeah, I think, it should, I think it should be. I don't know the answer, um, but we, do, we are seeing yeah, interest in, in putting more of the remote sensing data into, into forecast systems. Hmm. So it could be uh, quick scat data, which is retrieval of, of uh, wind speeds over oceans, uh, but it could also be uh, radar. I suppose my, one, my, my query or would be ha um, the scales, um, so that we maybe I'd, I'd need to look into that because the MESA scale normally works with domains that are um, several hundreds of, of kilometers in size. And so you need to, how, how you actually integrate a um, quite a fine detailed radar hmm. um, picture of the flow into that. Uh, I don't know of anyone who's doing that at the moment. So if, if anyone does, then please um, yeah. let me know. Okay, uh, I guess we could go on, but uh, now it's time for the next speaker. So thank you again, uh, thank you. Jake.